Welcome to this video from the River Meadow technical team. In this video we're going to be looking at how we migrate to VMware on Azure, or AVS as it's more commonly known. In this session we'll be covering the deployment options that are available for the River Meadow solution. That gives us the flexibility whether we want to use a SaaS option or whether we want to use an on-premise option. How we add a project and a user, which means we can delegate tasks and manage responsibilities. How we add a cloud appliance, which allows us flexibility in where we deploy and how we land our virtual machines when we migrate them. How we add sources with our bulk upload option, which allows us to pre-configure all of the sources. How we migrate using move groups, which gives us that application-centric approach. How we can upgrade the OS during migration, thereby retiring technical debt. How we can schedule migrations so that we can do them at a time that suits us. How we can run reports on our project to see where we are. And finally, how we do a delta migration so that we don't have to do large amounts of migrating all the time and we can do just what's changed. Okay, so let's look at deployment options. One option is to deploy our service as a SaaS platform. To do this, we would need to get access to the vCenter in Azure and connect to it using a URL. To do this, usually we would use a NAT firewall. And so we would have to set up a private address to be NATed through to the public internet. This would allocate a public IP and allow us to connect to your vCenter. The NAT firewall would have to allow some ports through it. So we'd have to configure the firewall rules to allow ports through to the vCenter. We'd also need to do some changes to the network. Now obviously if you were to go for this option, the technical team would be more than happy to support you and help you to configure the options. For the purposes of this demo, we're going to use our on-premise point of presence. We've deployed that already. There will be a video coming out shortly to show you exactly how to do that. So let's move on to the portal. What we're going to do first is we're going to create a project. And the project allows us to contain the migrations for a particular use in one area or a project. First of all, we'll give it a name, then we can assign a cost center, then we'd have to assign an owner, then we'll give it a start date and an end date. Once we've done that, we'll estimate the number of migrations, we'll leave this one as active because it's our current project, and we'll add that project. That's done, so now we can see the project there. So the next thing to look at is users. Within a project, we can add a user. You can see that we've already got one which is set up as the admin, and we have two types of user, user and admin. Basically, the administrator has privileges to add users and manipulate entitlements. That segues nicely into we can manage entitlements. Entitlements are a license to use our platform to do a migration, and it's one per migrated virtual machine or physical machine. And we can assign those to individual projects to keep management of them. And what we've done is we've assigned 150 there from the top level to this project. So the project is set up and we're ready to go. You can see which project you're working in by looking up here at the top right and it shows you the project name. What we're going to do now is we're going to add a cloud appliance. We click on add new target cloud and we select where we want to go. Now in this case we're actually going to vSphere because that's what is this is. This is vSphere running on Azure Cloud. So we give it a name and we now have to give it a cloud URL. Now the cloud URL is the URL to the management appliance, in this case vCenter, that we need to communicate with. So we're going to put that in and we're going to paste that in. I've blurred this for security because this is a publicly accessible URL. We then have to enter a username and a password. This is a username and password to that vCenter in this case that can, has the privileges to do what we need to do. When we click test connection it checks that we have everything we need and you can see it says connection validated. We save the target credentials by adding target cloud. So now we actually need to go and deploy the appliance. So we specify the data center name, we specify the cluster name, we specify the location, uh, we can select an IP address type uh, whether it's DHCP or static and we can select the network name here as well. Once we've done that then we have to decide which resource pool this machine is going to be in. This is a VM, that's really what it is. And then we have to select the folder name and the cloud appliance vapp name if we're going to change the name. We can accept the defaults here if we want or we can put one in. In this case we are going to put one in, we're going to call it something different so we know what it is, AVS demo. And we can select to use a proxy if there is one, uh, in this case we're not using one. And so now we say initiate cloud deployment and it will deploy the VM or the vapp into 
our target cloud. So this will kick off a vApp deployment into the target cloud. We've sped this up just a little bit to, for the sake of brevity, but not, not much to be honest. And you can see now we've got deployed and we've got a green tick, which means we are receiving heartbeats from that cloud appliance. So now we have to add some sources. We do that by going to manage sources and we add an IP address, username and password. We confirm the password. If we need a domain, we can add one. But we're actually going to add this via our bulk upload facility, which is a CSV file located on the hard drive of this local machine. And so we're going to open that and we're going to upload that into the portal. This contains all of the information that we need to add a source. And here you can see we've added all the information. We've got a couple of extra move groups um, that we're going to use later to migrate sources. So move groups allow us to be application centric. So each one will probably contain an application. You'll notice that when I select the move group, it selects all the machines in the move group. So we've now selected a few and we've got a few machines to migrate. So we'll inspect them and do the pre-flights. What we've got to do first is select that cloud appliance. We select the type of migration. We're going to do a full migration, but we could also just migrate the data drive, the D drive, for instance. And so we'll check migration readiness. Now we've actually sped through this quite quickly. And so we've got that done and we'll go straight into the migration profile. We're going to rename that. So we're just going to make it easier to find later if we needed to. And you'll see that there below that are the four machines that we selected, some Windows machines and a Linux machine. And also the details of the target environment that we're going to. Now we can schedule this. So you'll notice that below here we've got now and later. So we can schedule this migration to happen at a time in the future. We can select time and date. So we can select days ahead. Uh, and this is the time on the local machine, so we can select any time in our current time zone. We're going to do it now because that's what this demo is all about. We've also got this concept of global settings where we can change everything for all of these machines. So we can select stuff that applies to every machine that we're going to migrate. We're not going to do that here. We're going to do it on a machine by machine basis. So here's our first machine. You'll notice it picks up the name of the source machine. So we're just going to change that source to target. That means that we're talking about the target environment. So once we change the name, we can now look at some other stuff that's going on here. So we've got a disk that we're going to migrate. We can do file or block based, and we can also override the CPU and memory settings if we wish to. Uh, we wish to configure a network adapter. So we'll need to select which network that's going to sit on and what IP type. And we'll also have to select the data store. There's a few options here that we'll skip over and then we'll move on to the next one. And we're going to repeat this process. This next machine is a server 2016 machine. We'll change its name to target. We've got the same options as we had before. So we've got a C drive. We've got the option to change the CPU and memory. We've got it attached to a network. We've got it attached to a data store. The next machine is a Linux host. So we'll change that to target as well. And you'll notice it's a CentOS 7.7 machine. It's got two mount points, uh, root and boot. We're going to migrate both of those. Again, we've got the option to change the CPU and memory, and we've got to make sure it's connected to the right network and vSAN data store. And we're done with that one. Now, this next machine, we're going to change it to target. But what you'll notice is something different about this machine in that it's a 2012 R2 data center machine. So we've got all the same options as we had before, block-based. Uh, we can override CPU and memory. Uh, we've got networks. We've got a data store that we've got to select. Um, but now we've got the option to upgrade it, and we've got the option to upgrade it to Windows 2016. So we're going to do that in this case. That's all of the machines now dealt with. So what we can do now is we can go and start the migration. So it's always pertinent to just have a double check and make sure that we've ticked all the boxes and selected everything that we need to select. And then we can go continue, and we get a warning because we had warnings. We say continue anyway, and it will now start the migration. Now, as is normal with these kind of demonstrations, we're going to uh, quickly rush through this and speed it up for the purposes of the demo. So that you can see the pre-flight, second set of pre-flight checks happen, and they're all successful. And now we've got four machines in migration. What we're going to do now is we're quickly going to take a look at one of these machines. We're going to open up the dialog and see what we selected. So you can see here that this is what we selected. This is the machine that's been migrated, all about the target, the source, and the appliance that we're going to use. So we'll collapse that back down in a second, and we'll go and have a look at the information about this migration, which is a little more interesting. 
So if we click on the I, you'll see that it opens up a dialog, and now we can see the migration actually happening. And in this case, there are four steps. Now, there's four steps because we chose to do the in-place upgrade. Um, and obviously, we're going to speed this up a little bit so we can get to the point where it's finished and everything's good. So you can see it's progressing quite nicely. I wish everything could be sped up like this sometimes. Uh, the data sync phase is complete. We're preparing the target, which means we're now booting it for the first time into the migrated instance. Uh, and then once that's finished, we'll start up the in-place upgrade. So the in-place upgrade means that we download a few files and we will then run an upgrade on the machine in the cloud. Just to show you that, we're going to hop across onto the machine that is now in Azure and show you that it's actually doing settings and it's running those settings. So we'll hop across now and you can see it's working on updates, updating the machine to 2016. This is done as per Microsoft's best practice to make sure that everything is legitimate. That's finished and now you can see we're on 2016 and the migration is just about to finish and it's all done and we've upgraded the OS as well. So we've retired some legacy debt. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go across and start looking at some of the reports. Let's close that down. You can see that we've got four successful migrations. They've all completed nicely. So we've got some stuff to report on. So if we look at reporting, we can look at the project plan. We can see how things are going and what applications and what move groups we're moving. We can look at uh, the full migration status, so how many migrations we've done. So we'll need to select a date range. So we'll select a date range, a start and end date for the period that we're interested in. So start date and end date, create the report, and you'll see that we've had full migrations, 100% of which have been successful. We can also look at exporting this as a PDF or exporting this as a CSV so that we can use them in other applications. Right, so back to migrations. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a Delta migration. So we'll click on Delta migration icon. That brings us up to a differential migration dialog box. Now again, we can run this scheduled or we can run it now. So you can see that we can run it later. We can run it on a given time and date. So we can run it on multiple dates at the same time. This allows us full control over when we run the migrations. We can run them overnight. We can run them whenever... Um, in reality, we quite often run up against time zone issues as well, so we can run them in different time zones. Uh, we're going to run this one now. The other thing I wanted to quickly show you is the advanced settings. So we can run um, the differential migration and exclude certain directories. By default, we exclude the .snapshot directory, which is present in NetApp filers. We can also update the source credentials if they've changed for some reason, and we can update the VM credentials, the target VM, and also the IP addresses. Right, we've started that one. It's ready to go. We'll migrate that configuration. It'll go off and run a Delta migration of what we've selected. We can see here that there's only two steps here. There's preparing the target, which gets the target ready for the Delta, and then actually a Delta sync, which identifies what's changed and then copies that across. Now, if we go and have a look at reports, because we fast-forwarded to where this is completed, we can see that in the reporting, under differential migrations now, we can see a differential migration. Uh, we just need to make sure we've got the right time frame. And there it is, the differential migration that ran. Uh, we're going to go and have a quick look at entitlements as well, because um, what we want to show you is that the entitlements are not affected by a differential. We haven't used any more entitlements. It's the same as before. Uh, we don't consume a license when we do a differential. So you can do as many differentials as you need to do during the life cycle of a migration before cutover. So during this video, we talked about the deployment options that are available to us when we're migrating to VMware on Azure that gives us flexibility. We also talked about how to add a project and a user so that we can delegate responsibility. We talked about adding a cloud appliance, which gives us flexibility into how we land the machines that we're migrating. We also talked about how to add sources and how we can add sources on mass so that we can group things and so that speeds things up. We also talked about move, using move groups to migrate the machines so that we can group them in an application-centric way. We talked about upgrading the OS so that we can retire legacy debt. We talked about scheduling migrations to make sure that we can run them at a time that's convenient to us. We looked at how we report on a project so we can see its progress. We also talked about Delta migrations so that we only have to migrate the data that's changed and not everything else. So with that, thank you very much for watching.
Here's a link to get hold of us if you've got any questions or you want any more information. And please do come back. We're doing lots of exciting things with the Revermeadow migration platform.